Hey, a pleasant good evening, everybody. Welcome into the Philadelphia Phillies versus St. Louis Cardinals series recap that our Phillies were able to take home the series, which is great to see. And the stat that you put in our group chat earlier is the first time the Phillies have won three home series to start a season since 98, um, two years after I was born. Uh, not sure <clears throat> where your marker was there. You were 97. So about a year. Um, so, yeah, it's been since we before we even could comprehend baseball since the Phillies um, have won the first three home series of the season. So it was nice of them uh, to be able to do that this year as I was actually at the game with my good friend um, Zach on Friday where Eflin, uh, I thought we were going to be at the game that was one of the best pitched uh, dealt for seven innings, um, only giving up two and had six punch outs. Uh, but Biscuit obviously topped that as we get to the last game um, in, a co- in a couple minutes here. But Eflin was amazing in that game. He had the movement back on his pitches. Um, his movement on his fastball is really good. He had the location everywhere. Connor Brogdon came in and just looked like one of our best relievers as a youngster yet again. And then Kinchler looked like Kinchler again where he had that one rough outing and now it seems to be settling right back in as a like you would expect from a veteran. You don't expect veterans to have a rough outing and then having to have it spread and spread and spread normally with veterans those are the guys that are able to kind of hone it back but before we get into the offensive onslaught because that's the bigger talk of this game what did you think of the fact that Eflin had a very good game through seven and then Connor Brogdon as the young kid I uh, was able to at uh, well he's 26 but a young kid in terms of um being in the league was able to get it done and now in 15 performances I'm in the league in general. He's 4 0 with a 2 5 0, according to a MLB app. So, what did you think of the pitching in this first game of being able to perform at a high level, even albeit the offense really showed out? Yeah, I thought it was huge. I mean, yeah, the offense did score six six runs in the second inning and gave Eflin that big lead. But when I mean, you just talk about the movement on, on his pitches, just talk about what he's done all year so far. Um, I mean, he's he looked good, and that's I think that's the most exciting thing here. Yeah, he I mean, he gives up two two runs, he gives up that one home run in the game. So obviously, something you want to see not see there was the home run. But overall, I mean, couldn't have asked for a better game here uh, in terms of what Eflin was able to do. And we talk about all the time. We know Noel is the ace at the top of the rotation. We know Wheeler's fantastic at the two spot. We, I mean, all year off season, we're talking about what's Eflin going to be in that three spot. We all know what he was once we lose, uh, once we hire the new pitching coach, and he's able to come in here and kind of change the way he's throwing the ball, and it continues to work. I mean, I know you're an Eflin believer. I know I am, and I think the fan base is really going to start to turn around on Eflin or turn for Eflin not turn around sorry um just as he keeps going because i think this this is what he's going to be i mean yeah obviously every pitcher is going to have those runs but bad games and, and that's obviously going to happen to him at some point in the year because that's the way baseball is especially over 162 games but i mean i think you're going to see a lot more quality starts from eflin than not quality starts and even in his non-quality starts i think you'll be looking at like four runs i don't think it's there's gonna be much of that seven seven or eight stuff. I think it's going to be maybe a four run outing, six innings, four runs from him. And that's what you're going to get from him. And with the offense on paper that this team should be able to win a lot of those games too, if he does that. But no, I think Eflin's phenomenal and he's going to continue this pace here um, as the season goes through. And I'm excited to see where he's at. And I think uh, this whole new coaching staff for him has done wonders for him and will continue to see that trend. And uh, I mean, Hey, Connor Brogdon, we all mentioned it. I and mean, we mentioned it in our, in our recap last time. He sees the Cy Young winner. I mean, he's, God, however, I mean, he's, he just wins every game he throws. He's, he still just doesn't know how to give up a run, which, I mean, obviously we're completely fine with. And I've seen these comparisons on Twitter, and I'm going to agree with it. I mean, he's like a, a nice young Ryan Matson for us, is the best way to put it. I think the way he mixes everything up. And, and we all know the fantastic career Matson went on to have with us and a huge part of that World Series team. And I truly believe this guy can be that team or be that guy. In uh, that eighth inning, seventh or eighth inning here, and the best part is you don't even need him to be that seventh or eighth inning guy yet. In this first half of the season, you can have him learn through a Kinsler, through an Archie Bradley, through a Jose Alvarado, and through Hector Nares. Yeah, 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 obviously. And I'm just saying, like, through all these guys, and and by the time 
whether it's at the end of this year, because I know some of those guys are on a one-year deal, whether it's next year or even if maybe, like you mentioned, Bradley's already on the IL, so maybe something else happens. I think this guy's ready to go, even at the young age he is, and I think that's what's exciting is he's able to kind of feel that role early on and get into into a nice groove, and we've already used him in high-leverage situations, and yep. he's escaped it fantastically. So, I mean, just, just to continue to go on here with Connor Brogdon, and every time he throws, it's exciting. It's like... I mean, I don't know when the last time we were this excited for a guy out of our bullpen. Uh, in all honesty, oh, yeah. uh, and it's probably uh, Dominguez when he first came up, I would think. Probably, yeah, so. I get, it's probably closer yeah. than I thought. But um, no, yeah, it's exciting. And, and like you said, Kinsley had the bad outing, but as a veteran, you expect he's starting to settle in nicely. And I got no worries with him. He's he's obviously a great pitcher last year, and we all know the steal of a deal we were on with him. I still don't know how we managed that deal. So again, credit to Dombrowski and company with that deal. But no, I think, uh, and we'll get into the next two games and their series overall, but I thought this was a very cur- encouraging series uh, pretty much from an all-around standpoint. And, and I know the second game yeah. wasn't that pretty, but yeah. overall, it's a lot of good things to take away from the series. Yeah, the second game was, and we'll get to that soon, but overall, it was good. I mean, you mentioned something in there that was, um, Eflin is likely, yeah, I mean, everybody has the really off games. You see Kershaw and Bum, Mad Bum, when he was in his prime, Scherzer still go out there and give up eight every now and again. But yeah, if you can give up consistently four as your worst, that's going to be pretty good um, to be able to get going when your offense is actually um, hitting like this team can do on paper, which they haven't been doing other than three games uh, this season. This here uh, was the third game of the season in the first game of this series <laughs> where they scored nine runs um, due to the help of Justin Williams not really communicating with Dylan Carlson that he could not see the ball for the life of him when Gene Segura hit it into the outfield. So then Alec Bone was able to score on that. Carlos Martinez, um, this game was originally going to be the battle of two former top prospects that are now shells of themselves. But then because of the rain delay, it became Eflin versus Martinez, and then Moore got pushed to Saturday. You can really see, it's actually kind of sad to watch what you see. It. Like, it's sad to watch Moore, how much he's struggling here, which we'll get to soon. Uh, Carlos Martinez, it's almost just sad to watch a former top prospect look that bad. Like, just come inside. He used to have that pinpoint sinker that could get you to just jam you inside, whether you were lefty or righty, or you could do that comeback, like, with a sinker rather than a fastball like Nola would do um, on the lefties. Now he just hits you. Like, he hit <laughs> like he hit Eflin to get a, the easiest <laughs> RBI in all of baseball um, when you draw in a runner on a hit-by-pitch, um, which was able to score Gregorius for the second run of that game. And then McCutcheon had a great just stay with it, um, stay with the pitch, hit to a uh, right field to Tommy Edmond, which is still weird seeing him in right field, but that's not here nor there. Um, Gene Segura scored, and Mickey Moniak scored on that. And then Eflin, the speedster of a pitcher, got to second base on that, you know, fly and deal. Um, and then Harper, who just missed two home runs, if that was today in the first game mm-hmm. of the series, if the weather was today, he would have had two home runs and this double. Uh, had a double um, between uh, Edmund and um, Carlson there that scored Zach Eflin and McCutcheon. So after the uh, second inning, it was already 6 nothing. That was very exciting and very fun to watch, especially hilarious to watch. The one play when it happens for you rather than against your team, when somebody just clearly has no idea where in God's creation the ball is, and you're like, oh, my God, he lost it. And then it, everything's just great in the world, and then you're up 6 nothing at the end of that inning um, due to a help of a play like that at the start that really gets you churning, and then that just seemed to really throw Martinez off of his game after that, and he just started giving up runs and bunches uh, for the rest of the inning. But obviously uh, you had to be very pleased uh, with that second inning there too. Yeah, I think it's a mix. I think you sit here and obviously you're happy you scored six runs and obviously a lot of things went well for you. And then you also sit here and you question, well, how bad was Martinez? And honestly, as a, as a St. Louis, if I was a St. Louis fan, it's like, what do you take away from it? I mean, because you look at that inning and you mentioned it, how it looked like it shook him up a little bit. I mean, you look at what happened. He strikes out JT to start the inning. Bohm gets an infield single to short, so obviously not a hard hit ball there. And then uh, Didi gets a single um, on a ground ball to second. So, 
you had a a weird kind of weird kind of feel to that inning to start. A um, couple weird different hit balls here. Uh, again, one to Carpenter that uh, one to Carpenter, one to shortstop, uh, and then you had the weird play in center field where he kind of loses the ball and then the double. So Which would have been the second it, out. Yeah. yeah. So obviously it got the Phillies rolling and it helped us with that inning, but like overall, like. He wasn't throwing bad pitches, obviously, to start that inning. And then you walk Moniac, and then and that that's where I think that kind of just shook oh, him yeah, up a little bit. And then think his, the command, his command kind of just went crazy. He hit Zeflin there, like you said, and then the Phillies started to get to him. Um, and, and it was I think best part one here was the, the Phillies' ability to take pitches and stuff because we've seen a lot of aggressive uh, approaches from the Phillies so far in this year. So I was kind of happy to see them draw some walks there, take some uh, pitches and everything like that. So I, I thought it was a good approach after that in, in that second inning. And then you look at it, what happened then, and Martinez settles down and, and throws. Is, Mart- you, um, you were able to jump him because of his defense. You still have to be able to. We've seen the Phillies in the past when teams would give them a gift just still look a gift horse in the mouth. In the mouth, I mean, <laughs> mouse. <laughs> um, and then uh, just not score and not do anything um, because they just can't get anybody in. So it's good this year, even though, yes, you've got a gigantic gift of the left fielder not communicating well enough with the center fielder when it should have been his ball in the first place. My friend Zach, when I was, when I was at that game, brought up that good point. That ball was all the way closer to center than left. I think he should have just called him off in the first place. But either way, that ball dropped. Um, That set off his mojo, but you still got to take advantage of that. I've seen this team so much time in the past not. So I completely agree with you. You got a gift, but you also took advantage of the gift, which this team hasn't done in the past. That's what I also liked seeing in this game, too. No, no, without question. Um, I think that was... That's what you said. That's something you had to do is when you got the gift, you took advantage of it, and that's what this team did. And it was it was a very nice inning, and that's why you went on to win that game. Yeah, and then the rest of this game was an absolute shot to left field um, by JT Real Muto that scored Bryce. Justin Williams, who actually is a really solid uh, former second-round pick by the Diamondbacks, was actually part of the Goldschmidt trade, um, is a guy that they think is going to become a solid outfielder for them, showed his opposite field power. Um, and hit that in the top of the eighth to get their runs. And then Andrew McCutcheon uh, singled again uh, to said Justin Williams uh, to score Gene Segura. So that's what capped out that game, which was a 9-3 to win, as we're now set to move on to the second game, which was not as fine as the uh, first game, um, to say the least, uh, where Matt Moore came out and struggled again. Um it looked like at first maybe it was because he shook himself up in the batter's box on that one swing, but then they addressed that after the game, and they said that didn't affect uh, his pitching at all. So it's just he came out and looked flat again and struggled, um, did not have his stuff, really did not look too sharp in there um, at all um, again. And then a bigger concern, just because Matt Moore was such a wild card, a bigger concern for me, is after last season, um, like I said in the group chat, I think I'm not ready to give up on him yet because he's still young. I think he can go back to the ultra side and get it going. But after his good run last year, Jojo Romero's struggling mightily in his first couple of games this season and is is a guy that had great movement last season, kind of would miss bats based off of his movement is just leaving pitches more flat this year, leaving them over the zone. So this was kind of a double whammy in this game. You saw Matt Moore struggle, but then you saw someone who last year at times, we were talking about in our podcast, the chase of the pen is someone we saw kind of developing has struggled mightily in his uh, couple outings this year, that this far, which is three he has a 22 50 ERA. So what have you thought of Moore first and foremost, but then two, a guy like JoJo, who we want for the future, is struggling mightily too. Yeah, um, this this started off. Well, I don't buy too much in the whole plate messing him up. I think Matt Moore just ran into trouble. If it, I think you could use that excuse more if. He started the inning struggling, but you look at the way he started that six-run inning with the Cardinals, 
And he started off by getting a ground out back to him in three pitches and had an 0-2 count there. And then the next guy grounds out the short fairly easily on a 1-2 count. So Matt Moore was fine those first two batters, and then he just ran into some trouble. He uh, walks Nolan Arenado, and you know how much walks can kill you, especially with that Cardinals lineup. And then he gives up back-to-back home runs, so he just makes mistake pitches. So I, don't, I think he just ran into a bad inning. We'll see what he's uh See what happens in the further. Like we all know, we were taking a chance on him to begin with, so we'll see. It. We all we'll see how long they kind of ride that train. And yeah, I don't you think the know back you got... affected him because they said it didn't. I was just more bringing it up because it looked like it until they said in the post game it didn't. Because when you grimace that much, it looks like you did something. That's that's all it was. Where to say it did nothing seems a little odd to me, but. But yeah, he he, de- he definitely did just did not look good in general. I don't think it would have made much of a difference because um, this was just a game he looked off again. Yeah, so we'll see how long they try to ride uh, the Matt Moore experiment. Experiment. It'll be interesting to see what they do there and how long they give him. Obviously, you have a Spencer Howard waiting um, to come up if something does go wrong, and obviously you have a veteran in Vince Velasquez if you want to go down that road again. No. So we'll see what happens. Um, as no. far as Jojo Romero. Listen, I think he obviously is only, he's only 24 years old. He can turn it around and he can pitch fine here in the near future. And obviously we hope that and he does develop. But I, I think he's a, a lot of fun to watch. And he's a funny guy to follow on Twitter and, and watch all of his fun uh, actions on the field. But, like, if you really look at last year, uh, I mean, I think he was kind of over, like, in terms of, People acting like he was going to be your next best eighth inning setup, man. Like, I never really. Oh, no, I didn't think that. I, I thought maybe a like, good lefty. Yeah, like he was something. never. I mean, yeah, he might have had a good in, outing or two to start. But, like, if you look at his numbers, I mean, he finished uh, the 29th, or excuse me, 2020 season with a, a, a 7 5 year array, which is obviously extremely high. He gave up 10 runs in 10 innings. So, I mean, this is basically what he was doing last year. That's why. While if all the people are surprised about what's going on right now, I'm I'm sitting here wondering like, what? Why is well, everyone so shocked? Because he went on a good it's, stretch run, and his numbers are in such a smaller sample size last year because of one the shortened season, and also he wasn't up the entirety of it. So well, like he did good for oh, that stretch oh, oh, run, oh. and then went cold to bring his numbers up. So I think it's more people are wondering who is he? Is he? He's probably not how hot he was, but maybe he's not as cold as he is now. I think that's more like you had the same questions when Ranger came up. He started looking good at times out of the pen. I think it was in 2019. It might have been 18. And then he got cold again, where it was kind of the same thing. The Phillies have two lefties that you thought might have developed. Into, I never thought they would be set up people. But bullpen lefties. And then they both kind of just now are kind of in nowhere land a little bit and trying to figure it out. But – I think again, that's where a lot of people are missing. Like he, he was a he never really was that guy that I think people like made it out to be. Again, he only threw ten innings, and he I mean he gave up a run in one, two, three, four. He gave up a run in half of his outings pitched. So like again, I understand. Yeah, he came along and he finished the year with four straight scoreless outings. But again, I think, I mean, he never really was a, a lights out kind of guy. If you ask me, I mean, again, he. No, I- he definitely Ten, was not so, so to me, this is really no different than the way his season ended last year. Like that, that's what I'm getting at. Like, oh, don't get me wrong, I want him to be fantastic. You, you picked him in the fourth round, so you should get something yeah. out of him. But, but to see these early season struggles, can I sit here and say I'm surprised? I'm going to sit here and say, probably not. To be honest, I, I mean, I we'll think see, it's more, especially, like especially if you see him struggling more like Alvarado did in his last year with the Rays. That would make more sense because he was struggling all based off of walk, 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 because he has so much movement on his stuff and just couldn't locate it. Where JoJo, when he came up, the whole thing on him was he didn't have control, but he had movement. And if you looked at those stats that I don't get into as much, but all the like, like the rotation on his pitches, they would always say it was good for him. Where this year, everything he throws just looks flat for the most part, where I think when you look at relief pitchers, they're so back and forth, except for the best ones in their careers. Like one year, they're good. The next year, it's like fluff. Where 
if you can get them to kind of zone in the movement on his pitches, they would be good from what you saw last year, which is what I would remember them talking about on telecast. It's just this year he doesn't even have that movement. He looks a lot more flat. I think that's also a bigger surprise for people that actually notice that side of it too, rather than his statistical numbers, since he still is clearly, like you pointed out, developing. And you don't know what he is yet because, yes, he struggled mightily. He went on a hot streak. He's not as good as his hot streak, but he might not be as bad as his struggles. Where Suarez, uh, looking at his numbers, that was 2019. He had a 3.14 in 37 games and then only struggled in three in the shortened season. So you would wonder if a guy like JoJo keeps struggling and they do want to have a second lefty in there, even when Bradley comes back and figures stuff out there um, with Hale or something. Um, you would might decide to give Suarez a chance again, being he did really good in a bigger sample size of 37 games compared to um, JoJo just had that hot streak. Yeah, I, I think this is where the new rule, the Rod Manfred rule hurts from JoJo Romero. I think he's more of a lefty-on-lefty lefty kind of guy, and this new rule kind of hurts him not being able to just go in and face lefties. I think, again, that's why you see him run into trouble. What is he doing? He's facing a Paul Goldschmidt right-handed fantastic hitter. He gives up the home run to Nolan Arenado, fantastic right-handed hitter. Then he gives up a home run to another right-handed hitter, Yadier Molina. That's where he's giving up his runs. I think that's the big issue there. Oh, I really, he kills lefties, too. I don't, I don't think – well, I didn't get a home run to him. Um I think uh Oh yes he did. He gave up a home run to Paul Dale. Not not Jojo. His Oh Jojo. Only, oh, oh okay. he only gave Jojo. three runs. Three runs about. came from a Paul oh, Goldschmidt okay. single, yeah. Nolan Arenado, two run home run, and then the Merlina solo home run. Um so again, I, I don't think you're you're looking at it there. Uh you look at his he is getting barreled up a lot more than last year. I I will say that. Uh barrel percentage is eighteen point two percent already. Um, compared to a three last year, so obviously a bigger number there. Um, yeah, that's what I mean. Like that would kind of speak to. It seems like his pitches are more flat. They're getting barreled up more. Like that's kind of what I'm getting at. I don't think he's ever been the sexiest pitcher, like you were saying. I just think there was more movement there where he just looks boring this year. Everything looks flat. Where that's not what you took from Romero. He was that crazy, vibrant personality that kind of was the same as a pitcher. This year, everything just looks off and flat. No, I, I hear you. I don't disagree. And I, I think that's where you're looking at. Um, early on, yeah, it's it's been a struggle. Uh, I think that was a game, I, though. Let me ask you this, though, since we're getting long on covering the second game here um, before we move into the third game. This was kind of a game like the first game, how Schilt, once he went down, knowing his offensive struggles are kind of the, similar to the Phillies this year, why they're not above the 500 mark and where they're at the Cardinals. Um, it seemed like when he went down early, they went, okay, I don't want to tax my pen because we're probably going to have to use him for the rest of the series, and this game's going to take a lot for us to come back. From watching how we managed this game, it kind of seemed like from putting in, when you already saw how good they feasted off of a lefty and then you went to another lefty, it kind of seemed like you were hoping JoJo Romero could get through it, but really playing with fire there because that Cardinals lineup, is much better when you just look at those hitters against lefties than they are righties. So that, that did seem like a game you wanted to go, let's save the bullpen, and then you went Hale and Velasquez, uh, knowing that he kind of, after that third inning there, got dug into a pretty big um, grave. So um, I feel like that um, was kind of the reason um, those guys were put in that game, and we probably saw JoJo Romero struggle just kind of similar to the first game how it seemed like Schilt was just kind of throwing in his bullpen guys you would see guys in there that had like you would look up on the board and they had like a like Andrew Miller this year's like a nine eight something or something you would see a couple guys like that it seemed like that's what we were doing in that game to kind of come at them full force with Aaron Nola on Sunday <laughs> yeah I was I was a little confused by using Naris in the ninth but other than that I, I'd say I probably agree with you um, you're just letting it play out the way it played out, obviously. Because you built uh, yourself in such a hole. Yeah, so um, I guess they just need to get Naris work, but we'll see how it plays out. Obviously, he gives a scoreless inning, so nothing worried about Naris. Like, I'm not worried about him, but no. I mean, that's pretty much all for game two. It's just a, a, a tough battle. You're not going to win them all. And, I mean, we already mentioned they won the series, so I'm not spoiling anything, but he, he yeah. did what he had to do to end it with that game three there. 
Yeah, we did what we had to do, and I think that was the big game when I did the series recap or preview when uh, you were busy uh, before going to the game on Friday that I said they probably were going to lose. I mean, if you just looked at that game, the Moore game was the wild card. Kim has actually been very good in the first handful of games of his career. It was just his first start. That's the only reason you didn't know uh, what would come of him. That was definitely the game that was the bigger, uh, most likely, if you're going to lose in the series, that would be the one I would peg they would not be able to win, and the Cardinals had the advantage in. And that ended up being the case. But in the third one, just like we thought, uh, the Phillies ended up having the advantage. Now, John Gant um, did all of a sudden reinvent himself, <laughs> like they were talking about on the telecast, to go from being a um, starter back again from being a reliever like he was for a while he said he was like a cowboy slinger or a cowboy hurler or something like that in the bullpen. It was some funny quote. And then in the and then as a starter, he actually uses his athleticism. <laughs> like, like, that's why the difference of velocity is like he was 98 at times out of the pen. He's like 91, 92 with the movement on his fastball as a starter. But um he actually pitched pretty good um against the Phillies all considered um he walked five of us but we didn't take advantage of it he did again the big thing i would say is he had five strikeouts which was because they could not pick up they brought it up in the telecast too his movement on his two seam or whatever that fastball was that comes back that he throws it looks like a two seamer where he got guys looking with that the phillies in this game um, really had pitches again. Yes, we uh, obviously won this game, so I'm not going to harp on it too much. But you were still one for five. You left nine on base. Um, you had pitches by him that you looked at that it just seemed like you weren't picking it up at all when they were pitches that you seemed like you could have hit. Where this game was no if ands or buts carried on the back of Harper hitting a bomb. And then Aaron Nola pitching one of the best games of his career and uh, really locating everything really well and finally getting that first nine-inning um, complete game rather than a seven-inning complete game in a doubleheader. That, that's what won the Phillies. The Phillies won this game because of Aaron Nola primarily. And then two, uh, Bryce Harper hitting a home run. And then the fact that Alec Boehm was, while just missing a grand slam, able to get a sack fly. But... It was Harper starting them off good, then Nola just never looking back was really what won the Phillies this game because they should have been able to, because of those walks, take more advantage of Gant. But I, the reason I say pitch well is you still got through five innings on five walks. You get through five, if you get through five innings on five walks, that means you had to have enough movement or the guys, like I said, just were looking at pitches that I don't know why you were looking at. And I feel like... That was still an issue for the Phillies today. The only game their offense was good was game one. But we did win this game. I'm not going to harp on it too much. But you're not going to win this game with, like, if Anderson's pitching, you probably might not consistently win this game if you play like this tomorrow. So that's that's kind of um, what I'm getting at here. You still have to be – you can't just always rely on pitching, which has been more of what the team's been doing this year. But it was very fun and very exciting to watch Nola dominate that much. And I think it's better. You can disagree with this, but I feel like it's better for a team to struggle hitting and have their pitching perform well, knowing your hitting will probably catch up with, like you said, how they are on paper, rather than have it be like last year where your hitting's doing great and your pitching blows, where normally that doesn't always catch itself back up. Yeah. No, I, I hear you. Um, I don't – I think – there's, I thought this was overall, I mean, a win's a win. I think there's a lot of negative things to take away from this. Uh, the offensive concerns still concern me. I'll start with the negatives before I go to the positives. Um, this offense is still in a rut. I mean, we'll see when they're able to get out of it. Um, you gifted five walks uh, in this game. Like even JT and down, boys, which is unheard of. <laughs> you're, gift, you're gifted five walks in this game. You're only able to come up with the two runs. I think that's extremely concerning. Um, McCutcheon now averaged down to 170 after another 0 for 3 day. Alec Bohm, another 0 for 3 day, hitting 222. Um, your center fielders combined are 0 for the last 32. Um, 
Uh, that's horrendous. I don't think I have to say anything else for that end. Uh, you're yeah. desperate for center field help right now. Uh, again, with a contending team, you expect uh, this team to contend all year round. Uh, we'll see how long the De- uh, Dombrowski and company are going to continue to use these three guys out in center field uh, until we see something else. Um, and like I said, early signs for Mickey Moniak. This is why I was concerned of having him be on the opening day roster because he just looks outmatched right now. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I, I don't know if you'd agree or disagree, but I think he looks outmatched right now. He doesn't. He seems a little too young still uh, for this, sp- this spotlight. Again, I think he can still turn to a, a fantastic player. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I think he still needs to work down at the, the double-A, triple-A levels before he gets uh, to this to everyday playing yeah. time. And we'll it see how long hard. it takes uh, for it to, to come here. I think that the positives, like you said, uh, from the series, Harper got robbed of a couple home runs. He comes in today, and not only that, but he goes three for three. So I think that was a, a fantastic sign. And then, of course, your ace today. I mean, I'm tired of people saying Aaron Noll is not an ace. All this guy does is go out and work. Um, I mean, I don't understand how people think this guy can isn't an ace or a number one pitcher. I mean, all this guy really does yeah, is go out and deal. And, Somebody asked and, a and question turn- if it's funny um, that people mention that with how well he looked today. And Girardi basically said, like, if you look at his stuff, he's H caliber. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing. Uh, I mean, again, I don't know. Uh, this guy's just been, I mean, he, he was in the Cy Young race the last two years, I think, up until the end of the year. Yeah, he's had some bad Septembers, but uh, it doesn't make what kind of pitcher you are overall. He's uh, 18 games above 500. We'll see where he goes. And I mean, this year he's got two one nine year race. So I don't even get the frustration with him early on in this season. So we'll see how that shapes up. I got no worries for him. I think him and Wheeler at the I top agree. are a fantastic duo. And uh, we continue to take away from there. And congrats to him for his first uh, career nine inning complete game and nine inning uh, shutout there this afternoon. And uh, I think he's only going to build on that as well. And I think. Uh, I mean, we have what we have the Giants to start this week, and then I think we go back and play St. Louis in St. Louis. I think we'll get another crack at St. Louis here in the uh, near near future. Yeah, I mean, if you could have a two point one nine, somebody tweeted this in a struggle in a in a couple of starts that you yourself said you struggled with your stuff. Um, that's when you know you're an ace caliber and a good pitcher if you can still battle through it to those numbers when you yourself in two of those games came out and said, I did not have my best stuff. Um, so yeah, I, that, that lingo, um, all that uh, doesn't make sense in terms of Moniac. Um, I would say he has looked out matches. It's hard for me to judge because he's faced lefties a decent pit already where I thought. Oh, that's, that's part of the game. Would, it's part of the no, game I know that, but I'm saying sides. I get that, but guess who? didn't hit both sides when he first came up. Jason Worth. Guess who made a couple all-star teams? Jason Worth. So a lot of guys don't hit both sides when they first come up. So I think I knew for a fact I thought he would struggle um, when it came to the left-handed side, where where that's what you were hoping Quinn was able to do since right-handed hitting is his pure hitting side. But he just can't hit a beach ball getting thrown to home plate. So... Um, yeah, he looks out matched. Also, I don't I, know what, what lefty he's, right. he's really faced. Moni has been facing a lot he's of righties. Been in, he's been in against um, Miller, if I could remember. I think he's been in against a couple well, of Well, relievers, yeah. But no, no, relievers, yeah, that's that, what I that's mean. That's like I mean, once a game. At, at like, starters, but yeah. He's as, starting as, against righties and not hitting the ball. I, I think he looked out matched. I agree. But I think um, they've also pitched him like he's got a lot of outside. When I've looked at him, he's looked just like you said, I don't know if it's outmatched. I think it's just too soon. So I, I wouldn't really consider you a match. I would consider oh, it. Both. Yeah, I would consider it you being not, not ready yet because you're not ready. Yeah, I don't. I, I think that's more what it is because on the telecast, they were even mentioning it. It looks like Nat might be on deck so he can get a fastball. Then he got a fastball down and in and he doesn't jump on them. So it's not that he's not getting pitches that he probably could pounce on. It's that he's not pouncing on the pitches, which – shows me more it's not necessarily you're not outmatched it's that you're not ready for the mindset of the majors yet where your mind is still that, kind of that, that, with the that would be getting outmatched no i would yes. think it would be more the organization just putting you in a bad spot it's kind of like a visa oh, it can be both 
like I wouldn't consider Alec Lyon last game getting outmatched. I would consider the team putting him in a bad spot. So it kind of depends on the situation. Like uh, if, I disagree. Uh, It'd be both. You, you, you can be put in a bad spot and still be outmatched in that situation. Yes, you can, but you're also expected to be outmatched in that situation. If you're well, oh, but I mean, whether you're expected to or not, it's still the definition of uh, being outmatched. Like I would just like look at more like if you have a pitcher that you call up straight from single A. No crap, he's not going to do a damn thing. Well, like it's more. Yes, but that that's that's still being outmatched. You're just putting like, him that's... in a bad spot. I would say you're. Not confident. It, it, it's a little, it's a different, I would just say he doesn't look confident. I'm not sure. Cause I feel like outmatched just gets hit with such bad terms. I don't like ever saying someone's outmatched. Cause people just take that a lot hard, harder and I think farther than it should be. If you say someone's outmatched, people think that harder. When if you say someone looks unconfident, that's something that's just mental. Outmatched could be. Maybe you're never get it, and I don't think that's the case with Moniak. I think it's more he's not confident here, not that he can't get it going with his swing because he looked fine in spring. So uh, I think it's more he doesn't jump on the pitches he should jump on because he's not fully confident in his head and thinking along with the major league game yet his head, his head is still with the minor league game. That's just more the way that I look at it when it comes to him. It's so uh... I think that's hand in hand, but I, my last thing, my final thought is, and this, I don't know if this is, I, I don't know who needs to hear this, but to me, it is sad that the headline for today's win has to be no debating Nola's and ace after first shutout. Like yeah. that, that is sad that it the debate, whether Nola's an ace or not has gotten that deep and bad that that has to be the headline after a win. I, I don't, I don't know who needs to hear it, but Noel is an ace. Stop questioning it. He is the ace of this team. Whether you like it or not, he is an ace, and he will be the ace for probably a long time. No, Noel, I completely concur with that. Noel is definitely an ace. Um, the Phillies should trade for uh, – now, I will I will agree with this sentiment of it. I, do, I, I don't think Moni has been commenting, so the Phillies should trade for a center fielder. Uh, I do think we have a GM that's a lot more proactive. So would I be shocked if we do that sooner rather than later with Dave Dombrowski? Absolutely not. So I would like I would not be shocked if by the second week of May, uh, we've traded for a center fielder at the absolute latest. Honestly, if the numbers continue at the way we're going, so that's something just to get some people excited to look at the rumor. Toronto Blue Jays. That there could be. That's your future center fielder, hopefully. Who won the Blue Jays? Randall Gritchick. Grishek. Oh, Richard. Oh, okay. He's once, on they, fans, so once, once they get healthy, once that team gets healthy and he's going to be an extra player, I'd go all in on him. Well, he's on my fantasy team, so that'll work out. I don't have Reese and him on my fantasy team that are both on our team. So. He's a guy that could probably hit the top of the order, too. You can move McCutcheon down to probably a better spot for him. Hey, I think you got to be open to it. Um, <clears> I don't know when uh, – well – yeah, he's been playing right field, but I think he can play center as well. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, Grisham can uh, play center. Yeah, yeah that's, what, that's what I thought. Yeah. But, no, yeah. I think it was he's with the Cardinals, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he's with Toronto right now. I just well, when he played center, score, I and he played he's... right. Uh, so, we'll see. We'll see. I think he's a name to look out for because he was part of uh, some trade rumors in the offseason as well. Just never got done. So, we'll see what happens. But that's all I got. Yeah. No, that's all I got, too. I thank you all for watching the Philadelphia Phillies versus St. Louis Cardinals a series recap where the Phillies were able to win for the first time since 98, the first three home series of the season as they take this series two games to one against the Cardinals on a 2-0 complete game shutout, first of his career for Aaron Nola. Everyone have a great, safe, and pleasant day and a great week and enjoy all the great baseball action. And please like, comment, and subscribe. We appreciate your support. Peace out, everybody.